I'm Dan Sweet. I'm with Vertical Aviation International, and welcome to our Vertical Aviation International at Work webinar. Today's topic is the hydrogen-powered flight and the Piasecki PA-890. I know there's been a ton of talk uh, on battery-powered aircraft, uh, advanced air mobility, and we are on the cusp of the next generation of aircraft. And there's been a significant amount of discussion on using batteries to power these futuristic advanced air mobility aircraft. And yet, while there are breakthroughs in battery technology and in charging technologies, it's not quite where we need it to be in order to conduct flights a reasonable distance or capacity. And so, what other renewable or low impact fuels are options uh, in the aviation industry? The act of turning hydrogen and oxygen into water could very well power vertical flight in the future. Um, while the technology isn't new outside of aviation, hydrogen fuel currently powers many city bus systems, for example, lighter and more compact fuel systems need to exist for technology to power aircraft. We're, we're almost there. It's, it's getting really close. That brings us to the topic for the day. The PA-890 EV tall aircraft is an all-electric powered, slow rotor winged compound helicopter. And it's going to be powered by a high temperature proton exchange membrane fuel system powered by zero avia. So with this topic, which I'm hoping we're going to get to uh, address some of those uh, uh, highly technical terms that I just went through, we are going to uh, have an expert on the subject for us. Uh, John Scott is the program manager for aviation VTOL hydrogen propulsion systems for Piasecki aircraft. John spent 24 years at the Boeing Company in various leadership roles across advanced military aircraft and rotorcraft, and as a plank member of the Boeing Phantom Works. John was a principal leader in the deployment of lean engineering and lean manufacturing across three major production sites to include digital factories in St. Louis and Philadelphia. He held multiple positions as a program manager and chief engineer for various rotorcraft and fixed wing ISR and battle command integration programs. And he is currently the program manager for Piasecki's future hydrogen fuel cell programs, including obviously the PA-890 eVTOL, Axel Prototype, AFWorks Hydrogen Propulsion System, and the U.S. Department of Energy's Aviation Focused Initiative. So we'll get to John in just a second. Uh, if this is your first time joining one of our webinars, we welcome you. We welcome our returning guests as well. Uh, we prefer to have our webinars be interactive. We want John's going to be going through a lot of information today, so we want to make sure you get your questions answered. Um, to answer, uh, ask a question, which we'll probably do all at the end, um, is uh, please use the question module that's on the bottom of the webinar uh, tool. That could be on the side of your screen as well. Um, you're welcome to use the chat feature to talk amongst yourselves, but uh, we pay more attention to the question uh, module just so we can make sure we get to everything addressed. This webinar is being recorded. It is also being live streamed on our LinkedIn channel. Um, video, links to the video uh, will be posted in 24 hours, uh, both on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, easiest place to do that is rotor.org slash webinar. We will be having a new VAI uh, link to that here fairly soon. And let's see here. stop sharing for me to stop sharing and uh john if uh you'd like to bring up your screen here yes sir i would thank you uh yeah. for that great introduction and thank vai for having me on uh this afternoon uh, absolutely john um you know uh Piyosaki may not be as well known as some of the oems but our industry would not be where they are today without the Piasecki uh, helicopter company. You guys have done some major engineering work over the decades, and obviously you guys are still advancing things today. So uh, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna let you get right into your presentation. I'm gonna leave my microphone open for just a second and uh, make sure that you can see it, and then I'll close my, uh, my screen and uh, microphone. Uh, can you see my briefing? Uh, not yet. Oh, I have it up. So I guess I may have selected the wrong screen to share here. Oh, I just didn't hit the share button. That'll do it. How's that? Uh, looks like it's starting. To, uh, there we go. Now I see it. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, 
it's a pleasure and I'll, I'll get started uh, and excited. I'm very passionate about this particular subject and, and the advance in technology and uh, had a chance. I'm here at in Montreal right now at the at a conference and I had a lot of questions surrounding this and excited to go over it. Um, you did uh, mention Paisecki. We are a small R&D company, uh, been around for a long time. Frank Paisecki was a maverick uh, in his day, uh, built his first helicopter and taught himself how to fly it. Uh, and Paisecki went on to develop the tandem rotors that has become the Chinook. And in the 80s, they sold the tandem uh, rotor to Vertol, which became the Boeing company and continued on to be to do advanced research. So since the, the sale of that of the program to the Boeing company, Paisecki has remained uh, steadfast in their focus on research and technology and bettering rotorcraft uh, and particularly specialties in ducted fan technologies. But I'm excited to talk about the subject on the lower right today, which is hydrogen propulsion for VTOL and for aviation in general. I am responsible for four major programs uh, at Paisecki. Uh, as was mentioned, we are partnered with Zeravia on the fuel cell side, and Zeravia is developing advanced high temperature PEM, which stands for proton exchange membrane fuel cells. Uh, they have a lab in England. I've uh, been over there, luckily, been to go over to England twice to, to be in their lab and watch them demonstrate the technology as well as see their progress in, in developing the HD PEM fuel cells them, themselves. There's a picture of it in the bottom corner. They're square. They look like little Lego blocks, which is very nice. That makes it modular. So you can take the fuel cells and stack them together to get whatever power output or power demand that you want. Uh, in order to advance this technology in aviation, like most uh, good scientists and engineers, we're a little bit skeptical. So you got to prove yourself and you got to prove that this stuff really works. So to do that, we, Paisaki, uh, ventured and started uh, about 18 months ago on a plan for this a program you see in front of you called HAXL. And HAXL stands for Hydrogen Coaxial Electric Lift because we bought a small EDM Aerotech uh, coaxial helicopter that has was uh, an in, has an internal combustion engine on it. And we're replacing that IC engine with hydrogen fuel cells. And our plan are, is to be the first to fly a manned aircraft with HD PEM fuel cells on it in the September, October timeframe of this year. So we're getting, we're down to the last five months uh, and the aircrafts are being inducted uh, into our mod center and all the engineering's wrapped up and we're quickly fabricating and getting ready to go into ground testing and then into flight test uh, to demonstrate that capability. Uh, while we're doing that to prove that they can, they can fly and provide the power and handle the dynamic uh, needs necessary for flight, we, uh, we're giving a contract from the U.S. Air Force under AFWorks to build a scaled version of the Haxel fuel cells. And by scale, we mean they meant bring it to a larger scale. So we are now building a 660 kilowatt, that's 885 horsepower sized hydrogen propul uh, propulsion system. And it'll be in a ground-based Iron Bird scenario. And um, we'll be testing that and building that in our new Coatesville, Pennsylvania facility. And that will be online towards the end of 2025, early 26. Um, so the fuel cells are being developed again by Zero Avia. And they're a next gen HD PEM fuel cell, which is why it won't be working until 2025, simply because the, we're advancing the fuel cell technologies from lessons learned from Haxel and from lab testing. So we'll have a brand new variant of the fuel cells with much more energy density per centimeter. Uh, and that propulsion system, the 660 kilowatts, just happens to be, plus or minus a few kilowatts, the right sized propulsion system for our PA-890, which is a brand new uh, ground up design, part 27 aircraft. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, it has a thruster on it. It has a rotating wing on it. I'll be showing you a few uh, pictures of that in a moment. Um, and it's been designed and built around the fuel cells. So their fuel cells aren't just part of the the propulsion system, the aircraft was actually sized, built, and shaped to support the fuel cell technology for the P-890. So the 890 and the fuel cells together are, 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 are in parallel development paths, if you will, uh, to make the aircraft be as efficient as we possibly can. And I'll talk a little bit about all the different efficiencies um, that make up the propulsion system. So now, uh, if you'll allow me, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour into just simple hydrogen, very passionate and excited about hydrogen and what it can do. So um, we're gonna spend a little time talking about that uh, for a moment. 
So it was discovered by Henry Cavendish in 1765. It is the most abundant element on the planet. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. You can't see it. And you can't hold on to it. But it is so light that if you had it in your hand, it would rise up at 46 miles an hour and it will penetrate the stratosphere. It's one of the few elements on our planet that can penetrate the Earth's stratosphere and atmosphere. And it will go into space and get pulled to the sun and get converted to helium. So that's hydrogen's life story. It goes from the Earth. If we convert it to gas and let it go, it'll be helium in the sun in, in, a, matter of, uh, in a matter of weeks. So let's talk a little bit about safety in hydrogen. A lot of people have some misnomers that hydrogen is very dangerous and some folks have some memories of the Zeppelin, et cetera. Hydrogen, and I've circled the things that, to me that are very important on the right. Hydrogen has a it takes twice as much heat to auto-ignite hydrogen as it does regular old gasoline. It also, uh, hydrogen has two point times uh, the energy by weight and four times the energy by volume as regular gasoline. Gasoline is probably one of the most dangerous things we could possibly use to power most vehicles, yet the general public worldwide uses it every day. If you saw gasoline sitting on the ground and opened up the cap, you can actually see gasoline's vapor come out of the tank, depending on you know your perspective, and roll around the ground. It doesn't dissipate like hydrogen. It doesn't go up at 46 miles an hour. In fact, that gasoline vapor is extremely, extremely explosive. Hydrogen does have some flammability, but not. But it's really hard to get hydrogen to burn simply because you have to actually keep it in a location to get its percent of H2 to air so that it will burn. And as you can see on the left, uh, you needed to have at least 5% hydrogen mixed with air before you can even start burning and it'll burn sideways. At 18%, the fire will burn faster than the speed of sound. And at 45%, it will, in a shock, it will burn at 4,600 miles an hour and create a shock wave. But if you have too much hydrogen, a 75% percent, percent uh, oxygen or hydrogen to oxygen, excuse me, then it won't burn at all. So you have to have, quote, just the right conditions for hydrogen to be an, an explosive material. Otherwise, it's going to go away. So we kind of have a our mantra at, at Piasecki here as we design is, is which you probably is kind of counterintuitive, is let it leak. You want hydrogen penetrates everything. It penetrates metal, it penetrates glass, it penetrates uh, the lines that it's flowing through. It penetrates everything eventually. But if you don't try to capture it, if you design your aircraft and your vehicles so that hydrogen can't get trapped in a corner and build up a percent hydrogen to oxygen that makes it explosive, then it's super safe. So let it leak and let it dissipate and let it go away. So everything that we design and everything that we, we're doing, a, the design methodology or approach is very different for hydrogen technology. You design it so that it will always go up and away and into the air and doesn't hang around. So if it doesn't hang around, it's not dangerous at all. Um, I'll answer any questions about hydrogen later, but I just wanted to give uh, give you guys a little primer, if you will, on hydrogen gas before we we continue on the on the talk. Let's see. Let's talk a little bit about fuel cells. There's two primary types of fuel cells in the world today: HDPEM and LTPEM. LTPEM fuel cells, low temperature PEM fuel cells, are what's in most uh, hydrogen-based automobiles. There are automobiles today that run on hydrogen fuel cells made by Honda and by Toyota. And I'll show you pictures of those in a minute. But low temperature uh, fuel cells, they work very well. They have great energy density, but they require cooling. And cooling systems require heat exchangers and accumulators and pumps and extra fuel line or water lines or cooling lines, which drives complexity, cost, maintenance, and different types of failure. And for aviation, the one thing that's worse, weight. We cannot afford the weight if we're going to proliferate hydrogen fuel technology in the air. High temp fuel cells do not require liquid cooling. They want to be hot. In fact, they don't even start operating until they get to 160 degrees Celsius. So they like to run between 160 and 180. That's kind of the you know the sweet spot for temperature, um, and that's where they like to stay. So you don't carry any of the conditioning of liquids, of liquid cooling, of heat exchangers or pumps, et cetera. For a high temp fuel cell, you just take the high temp fuel cell and you, and it can stay conditioned temperature wise with simple fans. So our systems are fuel cells, oxygen, hydrogen, and cooling fans, a very, very simple system. And the fuel cell itself has no moving parts. It has nothing more than a bunch of plates and a membrane track between the plates and a whole lot of small capillaries that are 
uh, on the plate, and that's where the oxygen and the hydrogen flow through on each side of the membrane, and then that's how the, the uh, uh, chemi uh, chemical conversion takes place, and we get back water vapor and electricity. So it's a beautiful system with one of the most abundant elements in the world. It's clean. Uh, the hydrogen is easy to make, particularly nowadays. So, you know, Mike Hirschberg, uh, the president of VFS, the Vertical Flight Society, him and I were talking about a month ago, and he said, imagine if we were having this discussion and hydrogen was already out there and we were talking about how to get the, the aviation world to switch to gasoline. And that was such a, you know, vague question, but... It, it's kind of funny and counterintuitive because that's exactly where we are. If hydrogen was already proliferated out through the world, we wouldn't be having a discussion about moving to gasoline. Gasoline is dangerous and is dirty, and it gets on a, on your clothes and it gets on your hands. You can't get it off even after you, if you wash your hands with soap. It stays on there for four to six hours. And it's dirty to fabricate, and it's dirty when it burns. So it's amazing how we are uh, trying to sell, if you will, or trying to educate the, the public on the capability of hydrogen technology and hydrogen fuel cells when in reality, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, we probably, it, it should have been the baseline to begin with. But of course, you know, history is a funny, funny way of uh, teaching us a lot. And one thing, I, you know, one thing I learned was the need originally for ga was gasoline. We used to be a waste byproduct from, from, uh, from uh, oil uh, when we first drilled for oil in Pennsylvania, as a matter of fact, um, they were using it to, to, to generate, uh, to make kerosene. And the byproduct, which happened to have been gasoline, was actually thrown out. It wasn't used for anything because it wasn't until the invention of the auto in Germany that um, gasoline, you know, found a home and a use. Anyway, let's get back to hydrogen if we can. If we can. Um, this is the Haxel aircraft I discussed. As you can see, it's a small coaxial helicopter. There's a picture of it on the on the bottom right. Uh, uh, two counter rotating blades, so it doesn't need a, a, a tail a tail rotor. Uh, it's very light, very versatile aircraft, and it has a standard IC engine on the back. We're taking the engine off. We're saddle bagging, if you will, that middle picture, the fuel cells. Fuel cells are inside of, of sheet metal ducting. There's fans in there, and the fans uh, are placed in such a way that they suck the cold air in, mix with the e exhausted hot air from the fuel cells themselves, and then blow that mixed air back to the fuel cell to keep it at a constant temperature between 160 and 180. Um, the hydrogen, the rest of the electronics and the rest of the, the hydrogen tanks are on the belly of the aircraft. Uh, and it's a pretty simple system. And the picture in the middle is our, our harbor, in the loop uh, harbor in the loop simulation system. So we actually have the fans, which you can see there in that center photograph. I think you can probably see my mouse uh, if you can. So that is our, our, our lab where we have the fans, the electric motor. It's an MRAX electric motor from the Czech Republic. That's what we're using for our, our test system. Uh, and then a whole bunch of high voltage electronics and switching gear and power distribution systems to make it all work. So what's the trick in all of this? The trick is maintaining pressure across the mem each membrane in a fuel cell. The hydrogen and the oxygen have to flow across a thin membrane. The membrane, the PEM membrane itself, is kind of like a, a rubber balloon. It's super thin. It looks a lot like cellophane. And if you have too much pressure on one side or the other, you'll blow it out like a balloon. So the fuel system, which is just valves control and, and CAN bus controller, if you will, running valves is a, is a very simple system, but there's software that runs it. So the whole key to making a fuel cell work, because it has no moving parts, is making sure you get your fuel system to work. And the fuel system works by what we call balance of plants. So you might hear that, that term a lot, BOP. And balance of plant is maintaining the balance of pressure across the the each membrane inside the fuel cell by managing the pressure and the flow of the oxygen and the hydrogen. And hydrogen being as less dense as, as it is compared to air, it has to flow very fast. In fact, a little piece of trivia for you, uh, for this aircraft, for Haxel that we're flying right now, the speed of the hydrogen in the hydrogen line after it leaves the mass flow controller and heads towards the fuel cells is supersonic. It's going over 860 miles an hour. Now, it's not supersonic in reality because that would be the supersonic in an air in an air uh, type atmosphere, but this is in hydrogen, and hy so it's not supersonic inside the, 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 the hydrogen line, but it is flowing at 860 miles an hour plus, depending on you know what we're doing for flow to maintain the pressures. So that's what you have to do. So it's you've got some fast moving gas inside the lines. 
take a, a, a quick break from, from Haxel for a minute and talk about uh, another project we're working on that has to do with, with fuel cells. We worked a project, a feasibility project with the Department of Energy recently. And we've submitted that report and they've asked us uh, to, to clean it up so they can make it public because they'd like to get it peer reviewed within the Department of Energy and use it. And we're uh, extremely excited to do that. So we are working that right now with the DOE. But they asked us to do a feasibility study of taking a Robertson R44 and re replacing its IC engine. So pretty much similar to what we do, we're doing right now, real time with Haxel and replace the IC engine with the fuel cell. And what they wanted to know is if you did so, can you compare that between a battery using hydrogen fuel cells with compressed gas or using hydrogen fuel cells with liquid hydrogen? Um, and liquid hydrogen has a lot of benefits and liquid hydrogen actually won. Now there's a lot of math and numbers behind the table you see on the right, but I'll, I'll share uh, a little bit of the scenario. So they use the UAM market um, uh, requirements for uh, this particular analysis, because you have to have a CONOPS, a concept of operations, or a scenario upon which to develop this particular study. So the scenario was the aircraft in each of these cases, battery, fuels, uh, gas or liquid, is to operate on 50 nautical mile hops, or each sortie is to be 50 nautical miles, and to calculate how many you can get in during a three hour period during the busy time in the morning when air taxis would be most used. So between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. or seven, maybe 7.30 to 10.30, didn't matter, three hours in the morning. And again, three hours during the busy time at night. So 3 p.m. in the afternoon until 6 p.m. So six hours a day, six days a week, how many sorties can each of these scenarios do? Because they, you, if I have to come, if you're using a battery powered R44, you need to come down and charge. So we looked at and we gave batteries the best shot in the world in this analysis. We said, we're going to use 2030 data. So what's the projected energy for batteries in 2030? What's the projected C rates for charging and discharging? And we did the same thing for fuel cells. What's the energy going to be or the energy density going to be for fuel cells by 2030 based on where we're headed? All right. And then we looked at cost. You know, cost of electricity in 2030, as well as the as well as the the cost uh, for hydrogen, projected hydrogen for both liquid and gaseous in 2030, and ran a complete analysis for the Department of Energy and provided the data. So we were actually surprised ourselves because the capital cost of putting liquid hydrogen onto an R44 is about well, I can't remember the numbers exactly, and I didn't want to uh, kill everybody with data with the numbers today, but I think we was about. 21% more uh, than putting a gaseous uh, hydrogen system on the aircraft. But in both cases, the capital expenses paid for themselves in this particular con ops, in this particular scenario, in 13 months and 16 months, respectively. So if you were to just buy a brand new R44 off the line, don't charge me for a motor, give it to me without uh, any engine on it, and then send it to some magical factory somewhere and put fuel cells on it, what would be the additional cost to do that? And then how, when would it pay for itself in this scenario based on the UAMs, uh, which they have public, they've publicly placed the UAM market on what, uh, yeah, I, think, I think Uber Air actually helped uh, sponsor the UAM uh, baseline for the number of hops, how many people in each sortie, as well as the, what the paying customers would be willing to pay. And we ran a capital analysis across all of that and this is how it turned out. So it turned out that liquid would actually be the better choice, mostly because the refueling times are the shortest. So you can get the most sorties in in the three hour period. Uh, and um, so it was one of the one of the reasons why it, it won, because um, a turnaround time compared to both the gas, gaseous and the and the uh, battery charging. Uh, but there were other factors that went into it that made it more made it more appealing long term. Ga gaseous hydrogen was close behind, and then obviously batteries just due to the the time required um, to charge the batteries, as well as how often how many cycles a battery is good for before it needs a hundred percent replenishment of the battery itself, and you have additional capital costs. So this this is the result of of our our result our study, um, and as we get it ready to be um, peer reviewed, um, it'll be available for everybody on this call. Anyway, that was a quick digress on, uh, into the Department of Energy work we've been doing on, on fuel cell fuel cell development. This is the 
are really our mothership. This is what we are focused on, laser focused on, as a matter of fact. And this uh, is the AFWERK 660 kilowatt, 885 horsepower system. Now, as I mentioned, we designed and built the P890 around the fuel cells, meaning to get to to squeeze every bit of efficiency you can out of, your, out of the vehicle, the aircraft skins, the aircraft fuselage is the ducting for the fuel cell system. So we don't have additional ducting. We're not carrying the weight of metal and and all of the ducting and valve and all the, the flaps and and um, venting requirements for the fuel cells. We actually made the fuselage part of that. You don't have to do that. This is just an example where we where we gain back weight and weight being everything on a on a VTOL, we want to give it as light as possible. So the fuel, so the aircraft, uh, the uh, test system that we're going to be uh, assembling in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, if you went and, and looked at it when we complete it in late 2025, when we hope anybody on this call will want to come see it, um, you'll see the actual fuselage for the P890. We're actually 3D printing the entire fuselage in the center, the center fuselage, and it will be in the test stand because you need the fuselage to operate the fuel cells because we built the fuselage and the fuel cell system around it. So if you want to verify that you can actually do that, you got to build your fuselage. So we uh, are working with a, a, a sub, and the entire fuselage will be three D printed and be in the in the tool uh, when you operate the fuel cells. Let's see. This is the P eight ninety. A couple of key things uh, that I should mention is when everybody looks at this for the first time, they go, well, it's a helicopter. Well, yes, it's a helicopter. We're not going after the UAM market. We're not going after 50 nautical mile hops. We want to show that you can make a genuine 7,000 pound helicopter that can hover just like any other helicopter. And our initial launch customers are the EMS market, but we can, we can also use it obviously for anything else. But we went after the hardest market. And the hardest design first, because the EMS market has a lot of strict requirements uh, on sealing the floor for, for bodily fluids, for uh, how the side doors open, for getting stretchers in and out, uh, looking at how to land, land in emergency situations in diff different places. Um, so there's a lot of requirements going into the helicopter that are more advanced than what you would get for just a, a payload carrying vehicle. Now, one thing I will note is even though it only has one rotor, this is a distributed electric propulsion system because... There are three or four electric motors going into one gearbox. So, you know, a lot of people think DEP, distributed electric, has to be, you know, five rotors or five propellers or six propellers to be distributed electric. No, we are distributed electric just like they are. It's just that we put all of ours into a single gearbox for efficiency because everything is about efficiency and then tied that directly into the main rotor. It's a 40 foot rotor. One other unique uh, capability of this aircraft is a swiveling tail. So the tail acts as a propulsor. Right now, you're, this photograph shows the aircraft in its propulsion mode, but it can also turn 90 degrees. So that in hover mode, the tail becomes the anti-torque device in the back, like a regular helicopter. So that's the, a couple of unique features of the aircraft. We're going to offer it in both gaseous and liquid. Uh, our baseline is gas, and that's where we're, that's what we're baselining the aircraft at today. But obviously, with advances in cryogenic, um, either fibro-compressed gas and or cryogenic uh, liquid hydrogen overall, both will be viable. It comes back to what the customer will want. If you want an aircraft that flies 200 nautical miles and, and carries a 1,700-pound payload, you can do it with this aircraft right here with gas. If you want to double the flight time, all right, for the same weight, and same payload, then obviously we would offer you it to you in liquid. The fuel cells use gas no matter what. It's just a matter of how you store the, the energy. It can be stored in compressed 750 or 850 bar tanks, or it can be stored in cryogenic liquid tanks. They're still under pressure as well, because it, you have to, but they're not under anywhere near the, the type of pressure that the gaseous tanks are, which is why they're much lighter. Today, the best weight to uh, tank ratio or to hydrogen you can get for a tank ratio is about 11% with gas. You get a little better, uh, maybe 13 or 14 with Cairo compressed gas. And then you can get, you know, some people will quote different numbers, um, but you can get up to 20 to 23% uh, gas to tank weight ratios uh, when you go to, or excuse me, when you go to carbogenic liquid hydrogen, you can get up to 23%. There are some companies that we are aware of that are doing some advanced uh, carbogenic development and may even get their tanks up to 40 and 50% uh, weight to liquid ratio. But the standard today, until proven otherwise, is around 20%. But that doubles the amount of 
hydrogen you can carry for the same tank weight. So either way, you can double your range if you can double your fuel. And that's pretty much what you get when you go between gas and liquid. So let's talk a little bit about questions that we get all the time. Well, that's a beautiful helicopter and all, but where am I going to get my hydrogen? Well, believe it or not, just in the last two years, there are more companies than I can uh, want to discuss that have seen the same thing that we're seeing, that hydrogen is coming, particularly in aviation, and are getting on board on how to generate it yourself. I mean, the beautiful thing about hydrogen is, is you can make it from electricity and water uh, using a, a what's called an electrolyzer. An electrolyzer could be as small as a small mini fridge, or it can be as big as an ISO container, uh, you know, a 40-foot ISO container, depending on how much hydrogen you want to make yourself. Uh, if you are an operator that operates 30 or 40 uh, EV tiles in a, in a centralized location, then it'd be right for you to get an ISO-sized electrolyzer and make your own fuel. And if you're a remote operator or don't have that kind of a fleet, then it'd probably be okay for you just to have hydrogen delivered, uh, whether it's gaseous or liquid, into an on-site tank. And of course, to do that, you need some permitting and commissioning. But believe it or not, if you're not, you know, storing, you know, millions of gallons of liquid hydrogen like NASA has to, you'd be surprised that the what type of com uh, commissioning and permitting is required. It's not as bad as as you may think. It's not as scary. But to new people in the hydrogen world. It probably does sound and look scary, like I don't want to go through all of that, but you'll find out that it's not that bad, but there's a lot of work to be done because every municipality and every region of the country obviously will have different requirements, the right different uh, knowledge uh, levels in terms of hydrogen and its dangers and its safety. And there's a lot of standardization that I want to talk about that yet to be done in how to fill your tank, the training, the regulatory, the users, the operators, the maintainers, so the amount of training and standardization on the number si right sizing valves making sure that we have a standard way to connect the hydrogen nozzle to the tank do we have a standard receptacle on the tank to accept the nozzle all of these things will require sae standards before we can say the work is done and we now have this proliferated correctly across the aerospace and across the automotive environment one of the another was another thing uh people ask as well yeah, great. There's a push for hydrogen right now, but is it going away? Well, first of all, I've, I've learned a lot, and I'll share that with, with the folks on the line today. Oil refineries are the largest users of hydrogen today in the United States and worldwide. 55% of the hydrogen in the United States in 2022 was consumed by petroleum refinery. You can't make most of our petroleum products, particularly gasoline, without hydrogen. Didn't I didn't know that. Ammonia production is the second largest user of hydrogen. So hydrogen's out there. The little sliver I drew on this chart simply states that if you, we, we could support all aviation, all eVTOL, and convert every single aircraft to hydrogen today, not that we would, but if we could, we would still only consume 1% of the current hydrogen production worldwide. So if you converted all the aviation, snap your fingers, and every air vehicle today went to hydrogen, we still wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't even put a dent and the amount of hydrogen that's available and under production today. So that's good news. So there's no shortage of hydrogen, I guess, is the message, nor, uh, and, uh, and hydrogen production is going up. And, and as it normally does, as, as demand increases, production will increase and, and follow. A quick look at hydrogen automobiles. There are hydrogen automobiles today uh, that are out there. Most of the hydrogen automobiles in the United States are all in California. Yeah, they have little apps applications on their phones and they can type in the app and see where the hydrogen which hydrogen stations are ready and locked and loaded and they drive their car there and they fill up i've been to the shell uh filling state hydrogen filling station in long beach california i watched cars and, and medium-sized trucks pulling in filling up i watched how long it took it took about 15 minutes uh to fill up their uh, large truck and it took like seven minutes for a car it looks it's a little plastic nozzle it looks just like a gasoline nozzle except that it um connects and locks, and then the machine automatically fills the hydrogen tank. Uh, it has a little IR sensor on it, so it checks the temperature of the tank as the tank uh, expands. If the tank gets below above a certain temperature, the IR sensor rings, and it stops filling the tank with hydrogen and waits. And then when the tank cools back down, which usually takes a minute, minute and a half, the IR sensor will turn green and continue filling until your tank's filled. So they've already thought of all the, the safety things that are, are typical with the new technology. But it was pretty, pretty straightforward. So... 100,000 cars isn't very much. It's barely a drop in the bucket, uh, at least here in the U.S., but it demonstrates that the technology, at least these are all low temp, obviously, but the technology to, to proliferate or get 
the a, a commercial application of fuel cells is is live and can happen. It's just a, ma a matter of education in this case. Next issue I have for aviation and eVTOL obviously is FAA safety and certification, which is a big deal. Now, most of us on the phone or, or on this call are quite familiar with functional hazard analysis, FHAs and fault trees, the standard uh, V and V verification validation curve uh, for typical systems engineering on the left. But is the FAA ready to start certifying eVTOLs, particularly for hydrogen, hydrogen tanks, high voltage power distribution, high voltage in general? And the answer is no. Are they willing to work with us and are they learning a ton from, from the industry? Yes. But today, almost anything that you want to do to certify a vehicle, particularly with hydrogen and, and an EV tile in general, will go through a special conditions report, which says, here's how uh, I plan to comply, or here's how I plan to certify my particular widget, device, tank, refueling system, and here are my method of compliance that I plan to use and show you, because a lot of the regulations, particularly for fuel cells and fuel cell technology, just aren't there yet with the FAA. But we work with the FAA. We PISECI do. We brief the regional office as well as the, the national office in D.C., and they are super nice, and they are all over. They will, they, a, a lot of them show up to our meetings. Our team's meetings with the FAA are full. They ask really good questions, and they are definitely here to help. So I see a positive pull from the FAA uh, to get hydrogen knowledge to them so they can look at it, understand it's it's what we're doing safety-wise. So we're learning from each other. Um, but right now they are uh, integrated into the commercial uh, world as far as fuel cells and hydrogen is concerned, and they're learning a lot from us. And we have an opportunity right now to work with them and make this a, a cooperative, a cooperative uh, venture. So a little bit about my concerns, and I circled the one at the bottom. You can't get something new out if we get complacent or we uh, start making dangerous assumptions publicly. This happened, you know, sadly, Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island was a nuclear plant in, in Pennsylvania. It, about 40 years ago, it had a small incident. The amount of radiation that was released was less than what you could get off a wristwatch. But the public perception threw nuclear energy back from a public uh, from a public concern decades Sadly, just a small incident that frankly was an incident in college. I actually did the safety uh, analysis of that particular incident. So I, I know a lot about it. It was near and dear to my heart. But aside from that, we don't want to have that happen with hydrogen. So as we go about our days, we have a three-legged stool here. One is hydrogen is not out there commercially, except for 100,000 cars in California. But if we started this wheel grow and balloon, we're gonna have a lot of people with some misconceptions. The second leg of the stool is hydrogen does have a very stable history. The petroleum industry and NASA, those two folks in particular, probably have the world's knowledge of how of safety and have the world's not world's policies on safety, right, wrong, or indifferent. Some of them might be a little lengthy, particularly on NASA's side, but for good reason. Um, and we have to learn from them. But the dangerous third leg of the stool is people that say things, and I was a bit, and I've actually heard myself maybe two years ago, saying the same thing. We already know how to use hydrogen. Hydrogen's like any other flammable gas. You know, there's lots of stuff out there. Just go follow those rules. That is not the case. Hydrogen is unique. It's not that dangerous any more than gasoline. In fact, it's far less dangerous than gasoline, and everybody and their dog uses that. But if you, we get complacent, well, you know, why we try to get hydrogen out into the eVTOL world or into the aviation world, somebody is bound to have it to not follow standard protocols and one bad incident is all it will take to set us back and when we're trying to go forward the last thing we need is things that can be easily prevented to get in the way this is new technology it's already hard enough and it's already tough we don't need to make it harder on ourselves by being complacent so as so i i stress that for evtel companies and oems suppliers of components that are going to that are heading down the path of hydrogen we need to just be take the extra minute and make sure that as we go take every step forward, we do it in a way that keeps safety at the front of our minds so that we don't, you know, end up hurting the very thing we're trying to help. Um, so that's just a, a a shot for myself. There's there, there there's bound to be more and there's going to be incidents because we're all humans. We make mistakes, but we should go into this with our eyes wide open that leverage the data from this from the industries that have already been using it, which is the petroleum industry and NASA educate the people as much as possible, which is number one, but most importantly, and 
and and above all, maintain safety as the foremost uh, precedence. And if we do that, we'll, you know, this will become a very successful, uh, very successful venture for all of us in terms of fuel cell and aviation and propulsion. Um, let's see the way forward for us. Um, is that I truly believe that fuel cells, particularly high temp fuel cells, are the solution for eVTOL. Um, and you're going to see more and more and more of it, I believe. Um, we, along with Zero Avia, are going to fly Haxel this year. And we're excited and to be the first manned flight of high temp fuel cells. So, you know, as you see the news and say, I remember that guy talking on, the, on a webinar about uh, hydrogen fuel cells, you'll be able to say, yep, yeah, they, they did it. And lastly, we're working with AFWorks and the Air Force to finish the demonstrate and at scale fuel cell system for propulsion. And when we do that, we'll be using fuel cells that have some pretty high energy uh, per square centimeter per kilogram. And it's, you know, and I could, you know, this is my last chart. So, I, and I hopefully I didn't take up too much time of everybody's time, but um, we're working towards continuing ener our energy density maturation and high point, or excuse me, zero avia is a key is a key uh, component of that they used to be called high point, but there's zero avia now, but zero avia um, has a, has a, a very good technology maturation roadmap. Um, right now, you know, people are probably going to ask ask me uh, at the end of this presentation, what is your energy density right now? Right now, we are in, we are at 0.8 um, kilowatts per kilogram, are at the stack level, which is how we count, which is a, a a pretty tough thing to do, and that's what our focus is. Stack being one of those square cubes that you see. Uh, we expect to be at 1.9, and that's our goal with AppWorks for the Air Force, so doubling that between now and 16 months from now. And then Zero Avia has a goal to go much, much higher than that, uh, to five by 2030. And then when we get to, and I would hate to give you guys the wrong data, so I won't, won't so I won't, but slightly higher than five, it might be six, but that's where the lines cross and hydrogen fuel cells are now equivalent to a turbine engine. So that's the goal. So today we're already five times what any battery can do um, and we'll continue to outpace batteries and double double in technology uh, and in energy density. But from uh, but our real goal isn't to beat batteries. Our real goal is to beat a turbine engine and to be equivalent to a turbine engine. Um, so that's where we're focused and we'll get there. I'm 100% sure we're gonna get there just since we started working with Zero Avia in the last 16 months. Uh, the packaging inside the P-90 aircraft had 12 fuel cells per side. They have increased their their performance such that we now only have eight per side. So we now already have more energy in the fuel cells and the volume's already gone down substantially, as has the weight, simply because they've just made new discoveries in the lab. They've gone to a different membrane. The coatings that you can put on the plates can increase the the increase the uh, capability. So all of these little technological advancements that are happening on all these components are in, are, are continuing to improve um, the the electrical generation of the fuel cell themselves. So that is the end of my briefing. Uh, my email's in the corner if anybody uh, wants to send me an email or discuss things. Um, we're in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were in Essington, but we bought a new facility and we're in Coatesville, Pennsylvania now. And and as we get ready for flight test, uh, we invite you to come see it. That's it. Thank you. Okay, John, let's see. Uh, let's leave your screen up there for just a second so people can uh, copy that. Um, if we can get you to uh, turn on your camera, we'll go through some of the questions that uh, came came in. And I've I've got a bunch of them. Um, let's let's start with the um, the weight you were just talking about. Uh, how you've gotten more efficient. Um, Maybe we can go ahead and uh, kill your deck there, uh, kill sharing. Um, you talked about the weight. Obviously, you guys are talking about how uh, your first intention of the uh, EAX-90 is going to be um, air medical operations or air ambulance operations. Helicopters, operators being who they are, they're going to find other uses for those aircraft. Um, one of the things that uh, traditional aircraft have to do is consider the weight of the fuel during takeoff. They can carry uh, utility aircraft can carry heavier loads once they are getting near the end of their fuel cycle. How does that translate with hydrogen and the weight of the aircraft? What's your expected uh, weight of the aircraft when you guys first uh, have a prototype ready to go? So it's it's today the P890 prototype size to be seven thousand pounds, and there's some debate 
uh, even within Piseki, because that makes it a part 27. We've been uh, we have worked with our EMS operators and we said, what would happen if we went to a part 29? The difference between a part 29 and part 27, obviously, there's uh, some additional certification requirements. Some of those are quite substantial. Um, uh, the biggest one being, well, some of the biggest ones being, you know, takeoff, engine out takeoffs and being able to, to fly our longer distance over water. So there are, and, and that's another uh, question some people have asked me, is, well, what about a, a landing in water? How does this a high voltage electrical system handle a water landing or a water crash? Good questions. Um, so we've had to deal with all of that. But uh, one reason we went for EMS, and it, and I think it's just a good strategic decision on the, on, on the part of Piseki is, if you were going to put out something new and you wanted to have a centralized market, then it's kind of like if you had a new car, you would probably go to the rental companies, right? Because they have large fleets. So EMS operators have the largest fleets of helicopters. So if you wanted to go after a market uh, where you have a larger fleet or a lot of larger market base for an initial launch, EMS would be the logical place to go, especially. For, so that's why we, we selected EMS. Okay, well, you talked about uh, water landings. Um, one of the uh, questions came in um, from an attendee that uh, didn't identify themselves. Can you discuss the anticipated environmental impacts, if any, from dissipating hydrogen? Um, well, from dissipating hydrogen or dissipating water vapor? So that... uh, the question they say is dissipating hydrogen. So, so the environmental effects we have not. In fact, we've we've kind of been talking about, we work a lot with the Department of Energy, um, the U.S. Department of Energy anyway, on this very subject. We have, so the, the short answer is we have not performed any studies on the environmental impact releasing, you know, quantities of hydrogen. Like, as I mentioned in my my chart, if we are, we would be consuming 1% of all the hydrogen generated today, 55% of the hydrogen today is consumed in refineries. And I'm sure during their refining process, there's a lot of leakage and a lot of dissipation, a lot more dissipation of hydrogen at the refinery than there is for us because they make the very hydrogen that they're using. Whereas we wouldn't want to let any more leak than, than possible because we'd be in a commercial business and hydrogen costs money. It'd be like letting like letting fuel go. So I believe the aviation industry in particular will have be less wasteful and more mindful of hydrogen simply because it costs money. Uh, and we're trying to squeeze every dollar we can out of out of as an operator. So I don't see massive quantities of hydrogen being released, but I see massive quantities of water vapor being released because that's the byproduct of uh, of the fuel cells. Okay, um, we've got uh, a number of questions, but I'm going to ask one of the people ask if you could go ahead and put your title slide back up. You don't need to share it full screen. Uh, just bring up your uh, slide so people can get your contact information, please. Um, in the meantime, Paul has asked. Uh, Stating uh, you noted the uh, lower noise. Do you see this uh, sound signature similar to electric uh, EV tolls? Um, we have done an acoustic analysis. Is my screen sharing for you now? Yes, yes, we can see okay, it. Um, we have done an acoustic analysis, and we are seeing a 23% reduction in acoustics because the turbine is the second largest contributor to noise on a rotorcraft. You're not going to get rid of, well, I shouldn't say not. There are blade designs. Some of them are a little more sensitive and in the military, but there are blade designs to make rotor blades a lot quieter. This is a slowed compound aircraft. So one advantage that, that the P-890 has is we unload the rotor and put the load on the wing and cruise. When you, we do that, we can slow down the rotor by about 50 to 70 RPM. When we slow it, some people have asked, well, why don't you slow it down a lot more? Uh, the answer is blade flap. Obviously, you, you got to maintain a certain RPM to keep your blades from flapping, um, which increases drag and has other dangerous side effects. But so, but you, we, we can, we have not finished the tuning or stiffness of our blades to map where we want to go from a from an RPM perspective. But by slowing down the rotor in cruise flight, we create less acoustic noise on the blades. You can also shape the blades to again uh, reduce your acoustics. But getting rid of the turbine noise and going to an almost ultra silent uh, configuration is a big deal. And I'm glad somebody asked that question because uh, I, I I think it's overlooked a lot on the acoustic signature of the, of an aircraft. And so we will be much quieter than the seven rotor blade or seven propeller blade 
EV tolls that are that are planned to go out into the market today. If you if I've heard the term, we're going to fill the skies with all these air taxis. And frankly, as an AV as an enthusiast of aviation, I I hope that's true. I hope they're a little more organized than just filling the skies, but fill, they can fill the skies just the same. But uh, our aircraft will be uh, super quiet for for two reasons. I mean, granted, the batteries also the battery aircraft is also quiet. But by slowing down our rotor and changing the shape of the blades, we can tune the acoustics much lower than what uh, is traditional on the helicopter. And we don't like noise. Uh, I mean, people don't uh, under overlook, overlook it a lot, but if you go on a tour of a brewery someday with your family and you're taking your kids by the hand and you get into the bottling section and it's all noisy and all those machines are running, we don't run towards noisy things. The kids usually run away. I mean, we're all love going to air shows and hearing the sound of the jets. But other than that, in general, people don't run towards noisy things. It's irritating, and we it's like a hot flame. We go, we we tend to stay away from it. So I think the the it is highly overlooked um, the acoustics, and I think acoustic signature is a big deal, and we're paying very close attention to it. Okay, Pat's got a question. It's a question, and he offers an example of what he's looking for. What is the responsiveness of fuel cell to throttle control inputs? For example, in the context of an auto rotation with power recovery, is the hydrogen fuel cell throttle response more similar to that of an internal combustion engine in, in an R44 or a turbine engine helicopter, or is it different altogether? Well, it depends on what configuration uh, others will use. I can share for the P890, we have a small battery on the aircraft to handle what's called, what's called transient conditions. So the fuel cell is like a, our particular fuel cell. I shouldn't say all fuel cells. The high temp fuel cell that's going on P890 is a turbo based fuel cell, meaning to feed it, the, the there's two fuels, hydrogen and oxygen. But we're not taking an oxygen tank with us. We're getting the oxygen from the air. So in order to get the right amount of oxygen in the fuel line, we have to compress the air. So we have a compressor and the compressor takes time to speed up and slow down. So it's a turp, so it, it's a it's a turbine. So for the most part, it's, or excuse me, it's, it's, a comp it's a compressor, but it's a turbo compressor. So there's going to be a 0.6 second delay, which is what we've calculated through some analysis between when you ask for power and when you get the power from the fuel cell. Obviously, a pilot can't handle a six tenths of a second delay. So, in our analysis, we have right sized a small standard lithium battery, and that battery is in line with the power system. And the battery will will take up that six tenths of a second delay, so that the pilot will have instantaneous power during you know crosswinds and and other conditions when they need it through the battery while the air while the air compressor catches up and feeds the fuel to the fuel cell. So we thought of that and the quick way around it today anyway, is to have a small transient battery on board that is in line with the fuel cell. Okay, Gerald would like to know for EV tall purposes, how do you foresee hydrogen storage working at a vertiport? Is it will be trucked in or generated on site to support small or medium uh, fleet operations? And what about uh, hydrogen at say uh, FBOs or airports in general? I think for FBOs, they will definitely make their own because I think they'll end up seeing a, a benefit. They'll, uh, I think that we're opening up an entire new industry. I actually think that they'll actually make money uh, and still help the operators continue to make money because the fuel is going to be cheaper overall, but they'll be able to generate the their hydrogen on demand and have a small storage tank because they'll know exactly or approximately how much hydrogen they consume daily and be able to generate that or a little bit more and keep it compressed in a tank and and sell it if you will as needed to, to maintain our seller fuel like they do today is at, at an fbo area for other places i mean hydrogen is going to end up being a lot like propane tanks there's going to be cases like like today hydrogen fuel cells are all over the united states in warehouses that's where we because forklifts Forklifts at warehouses, there are a lot of them in the United States are hydrogen powered, Walmart, Amazon, and they just, they actually have a filling station in the larger factories, but in other locations, uh, they just exchange, they send their, you know, empty tanks back and they get a truck drops by and gives them compressed hydrogen, like you would with propane. For the larger aircraft, obviously that won't be, uh, wouldn't be practical, we'll end up filling the tank on site, just like we fill it up, uh, fill up a tank today with, with regular JP5 or, or kerosene. Uh, we have two questions, uh, one from Scott and one from Edward, basically asking the same question. Um, do variations of atmospheric pressure and temperatures, such as high altitude, 
have either positive or negative effects on the hydrogen fuel system? They have no effect on the hydrogen fuel system because that's a closed system. It's a closed hydrogen tank and it feeds the hydrogen directly into the system. And we have an and the pressure in the fuel cells is controlled by exit valves. So it's not open to the atmosphere. The both sides, the O2 side, cathode and anode sides of the fuel cells are both kept closed off from the atmosphere. But the compressor that compresses the O2 will be subjected because it's sucking in air from the atmosphere. So it is the only open side of the closed loop system to the atmosphere. So it will have to work a little bit harder, if you will, to compress the O2 at higher altitudes. So at 10,000 feet, it will consume more electricity because it's an electric based system. Um, electrical, it's electric compressor. So we will consume a little bit more electricity. So you'll lose a little bit of efficiency at the higher altitude uh, with that particular system. I should note, however, that for the P-890, at least for the Zero Avia fuel cell system that we're putting on this aircraft, we're getting a 7% efficiency boost overall on our fuel cell system because we have what's called an ATO in our system, which I didn't show in the diagram and didn't explain because I didn't want to have everybody's heads explode uh, on during their first look at hydrogen. But we not all hydrogen is consumed during the first initial phase process through the fuel cells, depending on how fast the fuel is going through, as I mentioned, hydrogen is moving pretty fast. And depending on how much reaction is happening, a little bit of unused hydrogen is that is exits both the O2 side and the H2 side. Well, that hydrogen can get burned, if you will, in a secondary stage, like a catalytic converter in your car. And that's called an F, essentially it is a catalytic converter. So it's it's a high temperature set of blades. It doesn't create a flame. It's not, we're not burning it. It's actually a second electro uh, electrothermal process, and that hydrogen gets almost 100% consumed in an in a catalytic converter shaped bottle at the exit of the fuel cells, and it heats up the gas. The gas, the oxygen, and the hydrogen get heated up during that catalytic conversion, and that hot gas is fed into a turbine on one side of the air compressor. So instead of the air compressor, the basically the fuel system for the fuel cell needing 100% electricity to run itself, it's getting a 7% boost because we have a turbine on the side of it so on this, sharing the same shaft as the as the compressor. And that hot gas from the a, from the catalytic conversion increases the efficiency of the overall system. So it's kind of like a two-stage steam, uh, you know, steam process, if you will. So we've got an initial stage uh, conversion in the fuel cells to create electricity. And then we have a second stage conversion. Again, it's still electrochemical on a set of hot plates. It just allows the gas to get hotter and expand. And we feed that into a turbine and get back more energy. So in a game of efficiency, every little bit counts. Okay. Uh, clearly, I am not a, an engineer. Uh, so you may have just answered this question from uh, from Jonathan. What is the power consumption comparison to produce uh, hydrogen via an electrolyzer system with gasoline? It appears that the cost of producing uh, hydrogen is high right now. Is higher, did he say? That's that's what he was thinking. Or it's, he, he puts a question mark at the end. And then, of course, it's followed up by another question from somebody else asking, what is the cost of hydrogen right now? The cost of hydrogen right now, uh, gaseous hydrogen, uh, is about eight dollars, depending on where you are. And again, and I'm talking U.S. dollars, and that was 2023. Um, and the gas of liquid cost of liquid hydrogen in the United States is about two dollars and fifty cents more. Running was running around ten eighty eight um, a kilogram. Excuse me. So it's measured in kilograms. Um, that is like very high, uh, in my opinion. But we're not even using hydrogen yet for aviation or automobiles at any scale that would matter. So like everything else. When you go to scale, things are going to change. Now, it's an inefficient process to make hydrogen from just pure electricity if you're buying it off the grid at the worst time of the day. Hydrogen generation is going to get is going to get proliferated through several several different methods. And some of them people aren't going to like because a lot of people are, well, we're, are, are we doing this hydrogen strictly for the environment? Are we doing this because it's the right thing to do? And I get asked that question a lot. Is it is it because it's green or is it because it's it, from an engineering perspective, it's a phenomenal uh, product for the transport layer, meaning air uh, vehicles, trains, and you know automobiles and ships. As an engineer, it, it is the right fuel for the transport layer for an array of reasons, aside from the benefit that it's extremely green. Um, but go back to the cost to to for electrolysis. Electrolysis is about a sixty three percent efficiency 
Uh, so that if you want to burn electricity to make in water to make green, the greenest hydrogen you can make, which is through electrolysis, you're going to take an efficiency penalty. The cheapest way to make hydrogen, which is how it's made now by, by and for the petroleum industry, is through steam reformation of natural gas. And there's tons of natural gas, all, uh, all at least in the U.S. and in large parts of Europe. Natural gas. So if you so so it's almost like, you know, it depends on again. This is government policy or from an engineering perspective. From my perspective, I'd rather proliferate hydrogen first and then tie up how much of it, you know, where we get it and how we get it uh, to make it more efficient, more green for for the future of our children. If we if we immediately say it can only be hydrogen from electrolysis then it's going to make then where it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot because now you're just duck, kept you're keeping the cost artificially high and you're not going to proliferate it as quickly or as fast and it's going to be a long tail to get that that demand up to get the cost of the unit down so yeah you could you know everybody has an opinion that's my my opinion is let's get it out there first and then we can tighten the regu regulations and the generation. And other people would say, no, if it's gone, if it's got, it's, if it's going out there, it must only be green hydrogen. But electrolysis is not as efficient uh, a process uh, as we would like it to be. It's about sixty-three percent. So you're going to burn a lot of electricity to make it. But making it from natural gas, which is just squirting steam through natural gas, and it separates the, the hydrogen from the carbons. And if you added carbon capture in that process, then you would obviously have super green hydrogen. And carbon capture isn't that expensive. At least the process of carbon capture is not that expensive. The cost is in regulations and storage of the carbon that you take when you do carbon capture, um, which is a whole other story. Okay, I've got time for one final question, uh, John. Appreciate your time. Let's uh, go for Felipe's question. Um, how about crash worthiness? Would a forced landing be more dangerous than current helicopters, for example? Well, um, I think in a today for gas for so I, I you know that's a great question and I've not had that one before. I have not thought it through on liquid. For gas, gaseous hydrogen, which is our baseline now for P890, in a catastrophic crash, which I hope there never is one, but you know we have to plan plan for the worst. In a catastrophic crash, the only thing that will be left in a catastrophic crash will be the tank. It's like two inches thick of carbon. So the tanks are extremely strong and extremely, that's why they're so heavy, because they're under 10,000 PSI of pressure. So the tanks are, you can't, you can't shoot through them. I mean, they're strong. They're, they're, they're the strongest part of the airplane, the tanks. Now, when you go to carogenic or go to liquid hydrogen, that's going to be a different discussion because um, liquid hydrogen tanks will obviously be thinner and, and lighter. They're not as thin as I like them yet, but they're obviously going to be much lighter and much thinner. And they will, but when they hit the ground and were to spill out liquid hydrogen, liquid hydrogen will immediately start to convert due to heat into gas. And at that point, it will be a, too much of it, so it'll be above, above the 75% mix. So it you can't ignite it, it won't ignite. But over time, in a crash situation, should it be 15, 20 minutes, uh, it forms a fog layer. So I told you earlier, hydrogen goes up in its gaseous state very, very fast. It doesn't do that if you were to take liquid hydrogen and pour it on the ground. And you pour it on the ground in a pool and it's pure liquid hydrogen, there's a phase, a fog phase. Hydrogen's still got some unique properties. But due to the fact that the ground is going to get cold immediately in that area, the hydrogen, as it converts from its liquid to its fog, to its finally to its, I would say, ambient temperature gas, where then it takes off and goes up, there is a period where that foggy hydrogen, liquidish, but it's gaseous, but it's it's forming its vapor layer, if you will. So it forms basically a vapor layer above the cold spot on the ground. That is, I have not thought that through. So the answer is I don't know what our safety procedures will be for the, a liquid hydrogen solution in a crash case. But for the gas tanks, um, I think there'll be the the that that that's a little easier, or at least from an analytical perspective, it'll be a little easier to discuss. Okay, John. Uh... Uh, I'll let you stop sharing your screen now. I think everybody should have your contact information. I appreciate your very frank answers. Um, uh, overall, uh, the presentation today has been fantastic. Um, I think that uh, we were able to get through almost every question we got uh, answered, except for some uh, one or two of the late ones. Um, I, I, you did indicate you need to get to the airport, so I want to make sure that, <laughs> that we honor your time. 
thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. Obviously, you were uh, presenting this morning um, at Vertical Flight Society. Uh, so we really appreciate your coming, doing double duty and appearing on our webinar today. Looking really forward to uh, watching the progress of your uh, system as you advance with it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your attention today. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, wrap up just a few things. I need to uh, share my screen. Where's the uh, the button here for that? Uh, here we go. And there we go. Uh, we have webinars coming up. Right now, we are trying to hold one primary webinar for VAI per month. Um, we do have a special one coming up next month, or uh, an extra one. Uh, next June 13th, uh, a month from today, the second Thursday of every month is our primary webinar day. Um, we're going to be discussing, and this is going to be either a question or a statement. It's going to be kind of an interesting topic, maintenance by the rules or, or by the norms. And so um, Mark Tyler, who is the one, uh, vice president at Precision Aircraft Services, um, suggested this topic uh, when he heard pilots talking about flying by the norms. And so... Obviously, I think there's a chance to look at uh, aircraft maintenance safety uh, when we're looking at uh, by the rules or by the norms. And so we wanted to bring uh, Mark on and have him talk about that. And then um, on the second, uh, the fourth Thursday of the month, uh, June 25th, we're going to have a special webinar in conjunction with the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team. I'm not sure exactly what time it'll be yet, but it, they, uh, their hope is to, or their plan is to discuss the FAA's new airman certification standards. And so if you're a pilot, uh, strongly recommend uh, tuning in to that webinar. The information will be available both um, through VAI and through the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team. VAI, like HAI before us, loves to share information. Um, we've got a couple of products that we uh, use to share that information. Uh, VAI uh, Daily is uh, a product where we go through Google, do all the new searches, find out all the stories that are going on with the industry, and we're happy to share with you. Um, we put it in one nice tight spot for you. We send it to about noon on the East Coast, so 9 a.m. on the West Coast, uh, even earlier out in Hawaii and Alaska. Um, have lunch, read uh, the daily news, have breakfast, read the daily news, depending on where you are. Just kind of catch up with it as you can. You're not the one who has to go through and search everything. We're the ones who are bringing it right to you. Rotor Magazine is a quarterly publication, printed publication, an award-winning magazine that uh, discusses a lot of the uh, subjects more in depth uh, that are affecting our industry. We look at some of the uh, advocacy uh, issues that are going on in our industry, talk a lot about accidents and safety, um, it's a great publication. Right now, everything is free. Um, we are looking at some options down the road. Um, in, in the, if you are out of the United States, there is a minimal, minimal cost for shipping Rotor Magazine. But um, overall, right now, everything is free. To sign up, just go to rotor.org slash subscribe, and uh, we will get uh, things taken care of to get those both to you. Um, we are a membership-based organization. Uh, we always want to know what our members and non-members think about what we're doing to help the industry. Please let us know. Um, easiest way to do this is contact our president and CEO, James Viola. Send him an email at president at rotor.org. Um, if you've got a question or a problem you want us to solve, he will often pass that along to the staff to address. Uh, we have a lot of subject matter experts here at VAI. Uh, we are happy to work with you guys to try and solve problems. Uh, that said, that does wrap us up for today. Uh, until uh, next month, we ask that you fly safe and you be safe, and we will see you again very, very soon.